Thanks, Sally. Well, as Viana mentioned, we are in the final week of our series in the book of Colossians. It's been a great time working through this letter from Paul to a church, um, figuring out faith for themselves, and all good things come to an end, and today is the time for that to happen. As Viana mentioned, there is also going to be a time uh, after the sermon where we'll be able to share, reflect upon what God has taught us over this series. So be thinking now uh, how God has encouraged you, what he's taught you, how you might want to encourage us with that. Um, But hey, as we prepare to jump in, why don't we pray and ask for God's help? Why don't you join with me? Lord, you have caused all scripture to be written for our learning. So this morning we pray that you would help us hear, read, mark, learn, and digest your word, that we might be encouraged and hold fast to the joyful hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, hey, in 1921, over a hundred years ago, these four men made a discovery that changed the world forever. Does anyone know what they found, what they discovered? One person, James. Clay, well, not really close. Good guess. Not electricity. They discovered insulin. They discovered insulin. This was a medical breakthrough that has saved and continues to save millions and millions of lives. Two years after their discovery, they were awarded the U.S. patent for um, insulin and its production. And they had a big decision to make. You know, do we hold on to this patent, and we can therefore own the production and distribution of insulin and make a fortune off it, or do we sell it for a fortune and get all our money right now? What do we do? They did neither of those things. In fact, they decided to sell the patents for insulin to the University of Toronto for $1 each. One of these guys named Frederick Banting said this. He said... Insulin does not belong to me. It belongs to the world. You see, these four men had discovered something so incredible, so good for the world, so life-changing that they couldn't hold on to it themselves. They couldn't keep it to themselves. They had to give it away and share it with others. Now, what does that have to do with us here this morning? What does that have to do with the book of Colossians? Well, over the last seven weeks in our journey through the book of Colossians, we have seen that Jesus is all that we need. That if we want true fullness in life, it will be found in no one else, nowhere else, but the person of Jesus. And if we believe that for ourselves, do we not believe that for others around us too? That for them, they will not have a true, full life unless they put their trust in Jesus. You see, Paul says um, in Chapter 2, in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ you have been brought to fullness. That is our story. That is our reality. That in Christ is the fullness of God. And we have been brought into Christ. And so therefore we have fullness in him. And just like Frederick Banting said that insulin is not for me, it's for the world. Surely this truth that we know for us, that we have fullness in Christ is not just for us, but for the world. It's for the people around us. That we might not hold on to it and keep it to ourselves, but that we might share it with the people in our lives. And so this morning, we're going to, as we wrap up our series, look at how we can play our part in others coming to find fullness in Jesus. We're, we're going to look at three things. Uh, how to pattern our prayer life, how to talk to God about people, and how to talk to people about God. Let's jump in how to pattern our prayer life. Paul begins this little chunk here in um, chapter 4, verse 2, speaking about how we should shape our prayers. I'll pop it up on the screen for you. He says, uh, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. Paul names three things that should shape the pattern of our prayer life. We should be devoted, we should be watchful, and we should be thankful. Devoted, watchful, and thankful. Uh, Devoted. 
Paul encourages us to devote ourselves to prayer. You see, our pattern of prayer should not just be something uh, which is haphazard and spontaneous, but rather something which is persistent, something which is regular, something which is habitual. Many of us wish we had a deep and rich prayer life. But many of us don't have the routines and habits in place that would cultivate such a prayer life. And so Paul encourages us, be persistent, be regular, be habitual in your prayers. You see, if you want to learn a language, you've got to be persistent. You've got to be regular in your practice of that language. If you want to run a marathon like Nathan Vogt in three hours and 20 minutes, incredible. You've got to be regular and persistent in your training. If you want a deep and rich prayer life, We need to be regular, persistent, and habitual in the way that we pray. Uh, John Mark Homer, in his recent book, said this. You will not drift into a life with God any more than you'll drift into a good marriage or accidentally stumble into mastery of a craft. It will require decision, commitment, sacrifice, habit, and fidelity through the ups and downs of life. Is that what your life with God looks like? Might we devote ourselves to prayer this week? And I just want to encourage you, if that's not how you would currently describe your prayer life, just start somewhere. Be regular. Make it a habit. Start with two minutes a day of prayer. And I don't know, set an alarm in the morning so first thing you're reminded I should pray. Set it in your lunchtime break so that you can be reminded to pray. Maybe do it as you make your coffee or drink your coffee. Find something in your life that you can remember to pray. And just pray for two Minutes. You don't have to start with 10 minutes, 50, like whatever it is. Just start somewhere and go from there. Our prayer should be devoted. And as we're devoted in our prayers, we ought to also uh, be watchful. We ought to be on the lookout for how God might answer those prayers. We ought to pray prayers in such a way that we expect God will answer them. If you're anything like me, I'll, I'll pray out loud or I'll pray in my head or I'll write my prayers down. And as I do that, they kind of just disappear out of my mind forever. Like they're just gone. I've prayed for that thing. It's done. But Paul says that we ought to be watchful, that we ought to pray and then head into our day and be thinking to ourselves, I wonder how God will answer my prayer. I wonder if the answer to my prayer is found in the conversation that I'm about to have. I wonder if it's coming after lunchtime. I wonder what God is going to do to answer this prayer. That we ought to pray in such a way that we expect God to answer and be on the lookout for how he will. I heard of someone a while ago who, um, they do the Bible in a year. So they read through the entire Bible, um, effectively cover to cover every year. And what they do is they have a physical Bible with margins in the sides and they write down each day what they're praying for. And so when they come back to that same passage the next year, they see the thing that they prayed for that day a year ago. And they get this thrill out of seeing like, oh, God answered that prayer, the prayer that I prayed a year ago. He's answered it. Or they get reminded like, I'm so glad God did not give me what I asked for here. That would have been really bad for me. And the fact that he hasn't is actually really good. Or they think, I need to keep praying for that. I'm going to pray praying that God would do this in my life and in the lives of people around me. As we pray, we ought to be on the lookout for how God might answer our prayers. And finally, our prayers should be full of thankfulness. You see, God wants us to ask Him for stuff. God delights when we come before Him as His children and ask Him for things. But He also delights when we thank Him for things. We ought to be thankful. And I take it thankful for all the blessings that God has given us. The blessing of redeeming us through Jesus Christ. The blessing of being brought into a relationship with God. The blessing of having the Holy Spirit poured out upon us. The blessings that we enjoy every single day right now, right here in our lives. And I take it too, uh, we should thank God for when He answers our prayers. That is, we're devoted in prayer as we're watchful on the lookout for how he might answer it, that when he does, we might actually stop and thank him that he has heard us and answered us. I want to give you just a model that you might use to shape your prayer this week. Up the back, we've got these little square cards. um, And really, they just have four words on the back. Um, The 
Is it an acronym? Four letters. ACTS is what it is. It's ACTS. Adoration, confession, thankfulness, and supplication. We start just adoring God, thanking God for who he is, telling God why you love him. And then move to C, confession, saying sorry for the ways that you have sinned against him this week and also being reminded that he forgives you. Thankfulness, thanking God, we've talked about that. And lastly, supplication, which is a word no one ever uses in life, but you needed an S somewhere. So supplication, which really just means asking God for stuff. Coming before him with your requests, with your needs, with what's going on for you and bringing that before him. You could do that in two minutes tomorrow. Why don't you take one of these, tuck it into your Bible, put it somewhere that you'll be reminded and um, shape your prayers in that way. Vine Church, let's be devoted, watchful and thankful. And as Paul tells us to pray in that way, he also tells us more specifically what we can pray for. He tells us how to talk to God about people. He says, pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Paul writes to the Colossians and he says to them, hey, pray for me. And pray that God might open doors for the gospel. As we carry to read on in that verse, do you see where Paul is as he's writing this letter? He says, Pray that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. If it hasn't been clear up until this point yet, Paul is writing this letter to the Colossians from prison. Now, if you were writing a letter to Vine Church from prison, or say you were writing a letter to your community group from prison, what would you say? If you me, I'd write to my community group, and I would say, pray that God would open a door of the prison cell. Pray that God would get me out, that I would be less uncomfortable in this prison cell, that I'd be back with my friends and family, that I'd have um, my life back together. Get, pray that God would get me out of prison. What does Paul pray for? Paul prays, I'm in prison. Pray that God would open up doors for the gospel while I'm in prison. You see, what is going on for Paul that would lead him to pray in such a way? You see, I think that Paul, you see, he doesn't have an earthly perspective. He's got a heavenly perspective. He doesn't have a a right here, right now, my comforts, my needs, what I want in view. He has eternity in view. And so he prays for things that are eternally significant. And the amazing thing is, Paul is no longer in prison. Paul is not in prison right now. But the things of eternal significance that he put his attention to are still seeing fruit. He writes to the Philippians from the same prison cell, and he says this, He says, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. He says, God is using me right where I'm at to advance the gospel. The gospel is still going out. See, Paul, if he wanted to get out of prison, could have just stopped proclaiming the gospel. The doors would have opened up for him if he did that. But such is his conviction, he keeps sharing the gospel, even in his chains. Think about it for a second. How did you become a Christian, if you are a Christian? Well, someone told you about Jesus. How did they become a Christian? Someone told them about Jesus. You could probably trace a line 2,000 years to the person that told them about Jesus, to the person that told them about Jesus, all the way back to the person of Paul, who was a missionary to the Gentiles, who had such an eternal perspective that even in prison kept on proclaiming the gospel so that we now might know it. What an encouragement to us. What would this look like for us this week if we were to live this out? Well, I imagine on Wednesday night or whenever your community group meets and you're praying for one another, it might look like this. Hey, pray for me. Because this week I didn't get a promotion in my workplace because I'm a Christian. So they didn't want to give it to me. But would you pray for more opportunities to speak about Jesus in my workplace? Or maybe it'll be like, hey, my friends are giving me a really hard time 
for my faith. My friends make my life difficult because I'm a Christian. Would you pray that God would give me more opportunities to speak to them about Jesus? Or maybe something like, hey, my relationship with my dad has not been the same for the last three years since I became a Christian. He started to cut me out of his life because he doesn't like what I believe. But would you pray that God would give me more opportunities to speak to him about Jesus? I don't know if you've seen The Hobbit, um, but there's this scene where they're walking up the lonely mountain and they're looking for the entrance to the hidden halls of the dwarves. Uh, And they know that uh, light needs to hit a keyhole and then the keyhole will open up the door for them when they put the key in. And so they're waiting and watching this spot for the light to shine upon the wall. And as they wait, the last sunlight disappears. And the hobbits and their company fall into despair. It hasn't worked. The door is still shut. And so they all walk away, but Bilbo Baggins stays there waiting and watching and looking until eventually it's the last light of the autumn moon hits the rock face and a keyhole appears and the door opens. You see, Vine Church, just like the, the keyhole would only appear if the last light of the autumn moon shone upon it, that's how the door would open. So for us, there are doors in our lives which are currently closed that will only open through prayer. And so we need to come before God and pray and ask him that he would open doors in our lives. So let me ask you, do you pray that God would open doors up for the gospel in your life? Do you pray that God would open up doors for the gospel in the lives of our mission partners? I want to encourage you to take two more things away today. There's these cards up the back and the size of a business card, they just say on them 311. I want to encourage you to take this, write the name of three people in your life that you're praying for. Pray for them once a week for a year and ask that God would open up doors. Secondly, pray for our global mission partners. Take that booklet on your seat home and be praying for them. Ask that God would open up doors for the Apazonics in France, for Emin Mon in North Africa, for Reach Australia, for Living Water, for Brian Lung at Sydney Uni. Pray and ask that God would open up doors for the gospel so that eternities might be shaped and changed. Now, um, just as an aside, you might be here this morning and um, you might be here for the first time. You might be here, you might not call yourself a Christian, you might not be a follower of Jesus, and you might be thinking, this is a little bit strange. Like, why are these people talking about talking to people like me about Jesus? Like, why are they talking about praying for people like me? Are they praying for me, like the person that invited me to church today? Are they praying for me? What is going on here? If that's you, I want to say two things. Firstly, you're not alone. There are people like you that turn up here every single week, people that are exploring things of faith, people that are checking out Jesus, people that are asking big questions. In fact, last Tuesday, we had 18 people here exploring Jesus at our Alpha series um, for the first week. You're not alone. There's people just like you here every single week. And secondly, we talk about this. We want to share this because this is the best news ever. Like this is the greatest thing to happen to us. We think that this is the most important things that we've ever known, more important than the discovery of insulin, more important than anything else. And so we want to share it with the people in our lives. We want to share it with you because we think it'll change your life forever, that you will find fullness in Jesus. And so if that's you, thanks for coming. Thanks for having the courage to step into a building you've never been in before. Thanks for the courage to be here. I want to encourage you, keep exploring. Keep checking it out. Join us at Alpha next this coming Tuesday here at 7 p.m. There's a seat at the table for you. We'd love to have you. You can find out more information on our website if you're interested, but we would love you to keep exploring. That's how to talk to God about people. Finally, how do we talk to people about God? Paul says, be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity Let your conversations be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. You see, as we pray that God would open up doors for the gospel in our lives, we ought to take the opportunities that present themselves when we pray for that. That opportunities will present themselves. I love this because Paul doesn't say, um, make every opportunity 
He just says, make the most of every opportunity. He just says, take the opportunities when they arise. And I want to suggest to you that you have an opportunity pretty much every week in your life to speak to people about the hope you have in Jesus. And it's that moment that when you walk into work on a Monday morning and people ask you, how was your weekend? What did you get up to? And you know, you could share, like, I went to the Swans game on Friday night, hung out with my friends on Saturday, and then on Sunday morning, I go to church. And just see where that leads you. See where that takes the conversation. And as that conversation, maybe it'll shut down um, or maybe it'll open up. And as it does, Paul says we ought to be um, full of grace and seasoned with salt. Full of grace and seasoned with salt. Our conversations should be gracious and salty. They should be gracious. See, the way that we speak ought to make sense of the message of grace of the gospel. That you and me, if our faith is in Jesus, that we have been saved by grace. That it's not like we've got our lives all together, but we are broken, messy, flawed people. And God doesn't look at us and just go like, oh, you're amazing, I'll pick you. You know, he looks at us and goes, yeah, like, you're still figuring it out. (laughs) But I love you, and in grace I choose you. That's what we believe for ourselves. And so as we reflect on who we are under God, we ought to also have conversations full of grace with those surrounded with us. And we ought to also have conversations seasoned with salt. Now, what does that mean? Seasoned with salt. What does salt do for food? Well, it makes it tastier. It it brings out all the delicious parts of a good meal. You know, too much salt is gross. You don't want too much salt. Too little salt, the food kind of tastes a bit bland. But the right amount of salt is delicious is appealing. It makes you want to keep going back for more and more and more. And that's what it should be like in our conversations. Our conversation should be attractive, appealing, make people want to come back for more. You know, we spoke last week about Jesus and what that means for you. Can you tell me more about what he what he means for you? Continue on. I want to know more. You see, I think um, people that have been around church for a while. Our temptation is to lack saltiness. We can be a little bit boring, a little bit bland, um, and we can just not really make the most of opportunities. Someone might ask you, what do you get up to on the weekend? And it's like, oh, I went to church. And people are like, that sounds really boring because you're boring. (laughs) But (laughs) what if we could share about our faith in such a way that, oh, you know, this is the best thing that's ever happened to me. Like, this is actually life-changing news. It doesn't have to be boring. Uh, The new Christian has the opposite problem. Sometimes the new Christian, it's like um, Dave Jensen a few weeks ago, it's like he said, it's like Christian crack. Um, Have you ever met a new Christian before? Like, they just can't stop telling people that they've become a Christian. It's like someone that's just started doing CrossFit or something. It's like, I have just, you need to come and know more about, like, you need to come and check this out. You need to meet Jesus. It's going to be amazing. Come to church on Sunday. The new Christian could probably deal with a bit more tact (laughs) and a bit more, um, you know, wisdom in how they approach people. But we need to be not, not lacking saltiness, but not too salty, but seasoned with salt in our conversations in the way that we talk with people about Jesus. Um, There's someone here that does that really well. I haven't told her that you're going to say this, but it's Sarah Chapman. Sarah Chapman is so great at having conversations seasoned with salt. Um, She, whenever she talks about Jesus, she just talks like a Swans fan on Saturday morning (laughs) after they've won the game. It's like, this is the best thing ever. You can see it on her face. We've got, um, we're doing, um, we've done Alpha and Christianity Explore with a group of people and there's this group of girls that are like, Sarah Chapman is just incredible. Like, I just want what she's got. How do I get it? She's very attractive in the way that she talks about Jesus and the way that it just resonates out of her life. We ought to have conversations seasoned with salt, conversations full of grace. If we truly want those in our lives around us to come to understand the fullness in life that we have in Christ, we need to begin by speaking to God, bringing our needs before him in prayer, We can't just pray and leave it there. We actually need to step out and and make the most of every opportunity before us. Now, as I begin to wrap up, you might be thinking, 
Well, that's great for you. Um, that's great for Sarah. She's just naturally gifted to that. But I, I don't have that. I don't have what Paul the Apostle's got, where he had a revelation of Jesus on the road to Damascus, and like his life was just changed, and then he just shared Jesus with a thousands and thousands and thousands of people, and they all became Christian. That's not what my life looks like. And if that's true for you, welcome. <laughs> that's what the Christian story is. In fact, that's what I love about the final verses of the book of Colossians. It is just full of names that many of us have never heard of before. Like, who the heck is Tychicus? <laughs> he sounds like a Pokemon. <laughs> like, but God used Tychicus. You might have never heard of him. You might not have thought about him for the last couple months. But um, do you know the reason why we have the letter of Colossians is because of Tychicus? Because he was the one that took this letter to the church. You know, Paul, the apostle, the amazing apostle, he could have written this incredible letter and it could have just sat in his prison desk drawer. No, but Tychicus took it and walked to the Colossian church and gave it to them. And he was probably thinking on the way, like, I'm no Paul. I don't have my life together. How do I get what he's got? But no, God used Tychicus. There's people in this list that we don't know who they are. We don't know what they did, but God knows who they are. God knows what they did and they matter to him. Let me ask you, does the name Harriet Ollie mean anything to anyone in this room? No, she's got a plaque on the wall right there. Harriet Ollie. And it says this. A member and most zealous worker in this church for over 60 years. Yet none of us have ever heard about her before. We've walked past her plaque on the wall. I mean, she's even got a plaque. You don't have a plaque, do you? She's got a plaque. <laughs> And you've never heard about her. In fact, I have no... She was here for 60 years working for the gospel. And I have no idea what that work was. I have no idea what she did for 60 years. But God knows. God sees her. God loves her. She matters to God. And God used her to do incredible things in this church that we now benefit from. And so it is in your life. As you head into your week this week, you might think, how could God use me? How could God use my prayers? How could God use the opportunities before me? God uses people just like you. That's the main type of person that God uses. So this week, let's step out in faith. Pray for opportunities and take them when they're given to us. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you so much for the fullness of life we have in Jesus. That we don't need to keep looking. And the fullness is not found in what we got up to on the weekend. It's not found in the friendships that we have. It's found in the person of Jesus, that in him the fullness of deity lives and we are in him and so we have fullness. Father, help us not keep that to ourselves, not to hold on to it, but to share it freely with the world, to share it with those in our lives. Father, thank you that you use people like Tychicus, Aristarchus, like me, like us to do this. And so we pray that you would give us eyes to see the opportunities and the open doors that you are giving us. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.